Well, it's great to see so many of my friends and colleagues in the crowd and on this panel. And thank you all so much for coming. I'm Chaya Glasner, and I'm a program officer at the Pauli Singer Foundation and representing a foundation very deeply invested in promoting public support for Israel. You can imagine how uh, energized I am being at this conference um, as the topic at hand today, creating meaningful connections between the Jewish state and the Jewish people is really core and central to this conference and <coughs> to so much of the IEC's work in general, which I am proud to say that the Paul E. Singer Foundation supports in many different ways. Um, I think once a point of consensus in the Jewish community, Israel has really become a point of contention and division. And I think today, um, we would like to talk about this relationship, um, which Professor Dove Waxman, I think, has aptly characterized as a relationship in transition. Um, and whatever the cause is, I think we can agree that there's no doubt that we must really now reimagine and reinvigorate this relationship um, and what it should look like and can look like now, facing today's new reality. And all of our panelists here are really at the forefront of this mission, connecting American Jews to Israel throughout the life cycle of Jewish engagement, whether it's on an individual level or on a communal and community level. So I'd like to ask um, our panelists to introduce themselves each. We'll start with Stuart. Um, and if they can, um, also uh, point out their maybe their main target population and a main challenge they see facing this target population um, in connecting to Israel. So Stuart, we'll start with you. Hello everybody, I'm Stuart Wax. I'm the uh, President and CEO of the Federation in Phoenix, Arizona. Happy to be here. Uh, our main target is actually our community. And maybe that sounds a little broad, um, and I'll touch on it later, really strategically, our Israeli-American community, Jewish community, and broad community, and creating strategies so they no longer are those three silos, but really become a community. And I think the challenges in that context is how long those communities have been siloed. Russell Robinson, the Chief Executive Officer of Jewish National Fund. Um, three years ago, we um, put together a billion dollar roadmap for the next 10 years. And in there, we focused on 25% of our income to be spent on populations under the age of 35. And that is a focus that we have shown one of our, our strengths or our growths uh, we have more donors from the 25 to 35 years of age group in the past three years. It's the fastest part of our growth. And high school is what we're doing with Alexander Musk High School in Israel and what we do in the elementary school. Our thing is to replace ourselves in the next 25, 50 years, 100 years, so we're a continuous organization. Hi, I'm Joshua Donner with the Shapira Foundation in Pittsburgh. Uh, we started Onward Israel, which this year uh, broad will bring about 1,600 uh, largely college students, largely from North America to Israel for two month summer internships. Um, so our target population are college age uh, young adults. And um, I think our greatest challenge is this disconnect between us as philanthropists and funders and communal leaders who we think Jewish, we think Israel, and our, uh, our on the demand side, the kids are thinking job, career, life, and how do we bring, uh, how do we figure out how to accomplish both? Hi, my name is Ben Perry. I'm the executive director of the JWRP, the Jewish Women's Renaissance Project. Some of my board members are sitting here. Um, and I'm sorry, I think I'm the Israeli on the panel. I'm also a um, council member for the IAC in DC, and I think we just had a new council in Arizona, so. It's amazing. Um, and thank you all for being here today. Um, the Jewish Women's Renaissance Project brings Jewish mothers because we believe that if you invest in a mother, you invest in a family. We bring them to Israel to inspire them and connect them to Israel and show them a connection to Israel that is uh, an immersive experience that hopefully changes their life and makes them connected uh, the rest of their lives. We're bringing 
We're about 10,000 women so far, and we're going to bring 3,000, 500, 4,000 every year from now on. Thank you. Daniel Krauss from the Birthright Israel Foundation. Um, not the token Israeli, but certainly the token Australian. <laughs> um, I'm assuming everybody's familiar with the work of Birthright in the last 16 years. Um, I'd say two challenges that we have are making sure that we have an ongoing pipeline of participants that are interested to take this wonderful opportunity to be on our program. And secondly, an ongoing support to make sure that we can continue this transformative experience for many years to come. So first, maybe we can discuss engagement and connecting on an individual level, and then we'll shift to the community level. So Daniel, I'd like to start with you. Um, Birthright really made the concept of Mifkash, which is the human connection uh, between Israelis and Americans, um, famous as an effective concept um, of connecting, connecting the two communities. So if you can, can you talk to us a little bit about why you believe this is such a successful engagement tool? Definitely. So Mifkash, in terms of birthright terminology, is our interaction of having uh, anywhere between um, five to ten Israeli soldiers on every single bus for up to five to ten days of the entire trip. And the different evolution of Mifgash has started as one day and then three days, and now it's become an integral part of every birthright trip moving forward. Birthright ultimately sees itself and not as a service to world Jewry, but a reciprocal relationship between the Jews coming to Israel and the Israeli society. And anecdotal feedback and studies have proven how important the Mifkash experience is. Um, to quote our VP of Education, Dr. Zohar Raviv, that the experience of birthright is not a sightseeing. My hero. <laughs> Many people's hero. Uh, birthright is not a sightseeing tour, but it's an inside seeing tour. And that affects not just the participants that are coming to Israel, but those individuals that come from Israel. And it's beautifully set up from an educational and an emotional experience where the participants from Israel come onto the bus in their uniform. They come as separate, they come as chayalim and chayalot, and then they change into their civilian clothing. And what happens after a few days of interaction, you start to realize that the bond, there's so many similarities that you have. There's so many connection points that you have, and as uh, Giddy Mark, the CEO of Taglid, mentioned earlier in the plenary, that they leave, and at the, at the moment, there's upwards of 80,000 Israelis that have participated in the birthright program. They leave now knowing 40 North Americans or 40 uh, individuals from around the world that care about them, that are interested in them, and it's created such an ex important ex element for them. The IDF has actually created a whole department of Mifkash um, participants, and it's impacted them, how they view their religion, how they view their society, and help them give them a platform to actually answer important questions that they perhaps took for granted. Why their Judaism is important to them, what Israeli society means to them, and it's become this two-way relationship that I don't think was ever part of the discussion at the outset. And Josh, following up on that, um, I think as a funder um, like us, actually invested in professional um, connectivity to Israel, can you also discuss how you see the role of Mifkash factoring into your work at Onward? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I mean, for Onward, like for Birthright, it's a key ingredient in the secret sauce that makes the experience work. And we uh, collect a lot of data uh, to understand that and how it works. For the Onward experience, it's a two month summer internship in a, uh, in a business or other or organization. Um, that's driving the career interests of the participant. So that connection is coming through their coworkers and their employer. So it, um, it's at the heart of the onward experience is the un uh, un un uh, unmitigated um, uh, experience. So um, we, others use lots of big fancy words, but basically they're spending all day working with Israelis and they talk over, you know, over lunch, they talk about what's going on in the country. Our educators are trained around meaning making to help them unpack those experiences. Uh, and it leads to those deep, rich connections um, that often continue uh, with continued employment after the internship and continued business connections um, uh, moving forward. And Russell, I'll ask you actually um, about Ms. Gosh, also in the business political sphere, but connecting um, really high-level government officials um, to some of the 
political and business opportunities in Israel, I'd like to ask you how you see that personal mifkash element um, as transformational there as well. So I think that I'm going to bring it to the local level, not on the government level of the national government, but we do a lot of our work in the Negev and Galil. Our lay leaders get to know the people in the, in, in the cities. They get to know the communities. They get to know the mayors. They work with it. It is, not, it is no longer where you're going to be able to take people to visit for 24 hours and spend a couple of hours and decide that this is the uh, relationship. The relationship is based upon partnership. It's a new reality. Israel is a new reality. Israel is no longer a land of exiles. Israel is no longer this poor country. Israel is now a brilliant place that you could be part of the winning solution and the winning formula, but you've got to participate. And our people get to participate, and we've opened up that door. They get to get their hands dirty. They work with the government officials. They work with the community. And they set those priorities and those funding uh, priorities as well in a relationship that's a partnership, not Big Brother. And I think that that is the new wave of the future. That's what you see with the soldiers, that we see with internships, and I think that that's where the growth and the uh, um, brilliance of where we're going in the Jewish community is. Um, at the Singer Foundation, we also definitely see, we, we're very focused actually on um, creating business relationships between the startup nation and the rest of the world, and it's amazing to see you know, companies and governments come to Israel actually interact with the people, the entrepreneurs, the high-tech companies, um, and really create those relationships that they end up taking off on their own. Um, and sometimes the business that comes out of it is almost secondary to that relationship, so it's definitely key. Um, Stuart, I'd like to ask you to shift to the communal level. You touched on, um, on that a little bit in your opening remarks. How would you, um, describe what an Israel-engaged community looks like. I just wonder if there's some phenomenon that causes people to kind of go like this when they see this kind of where everybody <laughs> shifts to the sides in rooms like this. I'd be that one in the back corner there. Um, I have to say an engaged community looks a lot like what Phoenix is beginning to look like. Um, and I don't mean that from any, well, I am proud, but I think I'll back from that into the approach we've taken as far as a community engaging around Israel. Uh, to me, it all starts with a very clear purpose and vision. And we began working really hard, both in engaging what we call now gen, the younger generation, and also the Israeli Americans. With the Americans, we chose to have a very, I think, unique approach. And from the beginning, it was about bringing everybody together. We didn't look at just, let's really build our Israel center to engage local Israeli Americans. Mm -hmm. Uh, we saw that as short-sighted because ultimately then they stay their own community, not part of the whole community. So we created a very clear vision of creating one community, but recognizing we had to pull that younger community in, we had to pull the Israeli-American <coughs> community in, and we had to pull the general community in, especially around Israel. Um, for us, our, if you want to call it secret sauce or approach to this, number one, it starts with a great staff, ours happens to be sitting right up front here, Shekhar, of really making a decision. We used to have a community of Shaliyach that we bring in and it would change every two years. Some were fantastic, some not so much so, but no matter what, you'd have that shift in focus and personality every two years. It's not speaking against that. We didn't have a structure to have both. So we chose to really bring someone in that would share that passion and purpose. Um, and then really build on there. So we created programming originally on our own and then partnering with the IEC to really begin bringing in the Israeli Americans, but instantly infuse our general community with them and not look at them in silos. When we'd have big events, we'd create VIP, but not the typical VIP where we'd bring from the Federation our big macher donors and they'd sit in the room beforehand. We would bring in members of the Israeli community and American community and actually assign seats. This was Shahar's idea. So they had no choice but to begin mixing. And this kind of organic approach started becoming one community. We now have Israeli Americans on our board, not in an Israeli American seat, but in the same seat as any other board member. They're supporting our campaign. They're supporting our Israel Center, soon to be our regional IC office, and really bringing diversity of programming together um, 
has worked exceptionally well in the beginning of having a very engaged community. Well, uh, and Ben, maybe you can also address how you see Israel as playing a central role in engaging young Jewish families. So first of all, I just want to say I'm inspired by what everybody's saying. And um, as an Israeli that just moved to the States a few years ago, I just want to a shout out to Birthright that I think Birthright changed the landscape of how the relationship between Israel and Israelis are with young people in the diaspora, which are not so young anymore. And like it's been uh, 14, 15 years already. And 16. 16. <laughs> and and you really see that because you see young professionals now that have been affected by, two, by one uh, life-changing experience and they see everything different. This is part of what inspired my board to start this program. And I also see um, other visionaries foundations that are picking up on the immersive, the power of an immersive experience. And we're so happy to see more of these experiences happening more and more. Um, I think the biggest challenge that I see for the Jewish community, um, and I'm, I'm talking about the majority of the Jewish community which is not involved in Jewish life, the ones that are not that connected. Um, the ones that are connected, and they're usually part of the Federation already, they're donors, they go to shul, they're connected, they're, 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 they're in a good place. The ones that are not are the ones that are drifting away, and it's very hard to reach them. Um, we see that through uh, sophisticated, if we are mindful about trying to find them, connect them, reach out, and tell our past participants and everybody that we work with um, that they are change agents, that we give them a mission to reach out and um, try and, and we tell them it's all about relationships and that they can be part of the solution, not the problem we can create a movement that is broader than all of us. And it's all of us working together. Um, I mean, we bring women from 26, I think, countries around the world. So it's a network. Um, and they come together, and they see the responsibility that they all share as Jewish mothers. It changes their perspective about everything. Then when they come back, it's not just Israel, but Israel is, is the tool, is the inspiration. But it's much deeper. It's about Jewish, and it's about the responsibility. And then the different organization we work with can take it to the next level and continue and get them engaged and activated, active, active and um, give or whatever the organization is doing. We can just jump off Ben's comments. Uh, Birthright is the largest educational program in the Jewish community, but we're proud of the fact that we've given birth to programs like JWRP, Onward Israel, and many others. And just to focus on the Israeli impact on the communal and the meta level, um, it's really given the Israeli soldiers that come onto the bus as individuals and a new understanding of what it means to be a Jew in Israel as part of this worldwide family. That never have they had a chance to interact with other individuals uh, that come from a whole plethora of countries and really connect what it means to be Jewish in the diaspora. And it's given them a chance to view their Jewish ritual through a lens of foreigners that makes them question things about themselves. Last time, I think it was two summers ago when there was the war in Israel, uh, one story that uh, stands out is one of the soldiers went off the bus three days early to go into his uh, unit was called up and uh, he'd really been on the bus for 48 hours and really had just started to make connections with some of the North Americans. And when you go into uh, active duty, you leave your phone aside. And he came back and he had 684 WhatsApp messages. Are you okay? <laughs> We'll miss you, checking in on you, for these people that he met for 48 hours. Wow. And that connection isn't just through WhatsApp, that comes back to when they travel to both respective countries and destinations, and it transforms both societies. It's very impactful. I'm curious if anyone else has a personal story. If I can story add to that, share, I just want yeah. to say... We could um, ping pong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also added Israelis on our buses, which is a new thing we started a year ago. So we now have Israeli mothers um, some of them are actually from Alexander Moss School, and they are coming as ambassadors, wanting to um, uh, connect and do a mifgash with um, the women from the diaspora. But really halfway to the trip, they see that they see Israel different, and they see Israel through the eyes of the person visiting Israel for the first time. And it changes their perspective on Israel and the diaspora, 
and the Jewish people. I'm just, again, we're learning from you guys and we are um, um, changing the program that it will be even more impactful and more meaningful and we see that this is a, a great thing that is, that is happening for us. You know, ben, when you were saying that, I, being not an Israeli, which you might have been able to figure out and <laughs> focus on local community, kind of uh, conversely, we've taken uh, some efforts to bring our local Israeli Americans on many missions and things to learn about the Jewish community. Uh, when we were looking to do a lot more work in engaging uh, young Jewish adults, we took a couple trips up to Detroit, who has been one of the leaders in Next Gen, Now Gen, and we intentionally took a, a very successful Israeli entrepreneur with us to kind of understand how American Jewish communities go about engagement, what organizations like, because what I've learned is it's a very foreign animal, mm -hmm. our organized Jewish community to what they're used to in Israel, and last October, they're actually sitting in the back, we took a mini mission actually to Las Vegas to meet with Sheldon and Miriam, see what's happening there, the IAC, the Jewish world, Jewish philanthropy. And it was actually on that plane ride back that Phoenix creating an Israeli scout program uh, began. And just this eight months later, I think we have 70, 80 kids in that program. I'm sorry, how many? <laughs> 76, I don't want to exaggerate or underestimate, 76 kids. So it's kind of been conversely of letting our Israeli American concerns about how, whether it's doing Israeli things or typically American Jewish community things, letting them explore it on their own in an uh, opposite direction. Uh, I'll, I'll just add, uh, yes and everything that's been said. Uh, one of our onward programs is the Michelinu program through IAC, and what's wonderful this summer I saw uh, Israeli Americans who didn't speak Hebrew, who had been to Israel a few times as a child, uh, so they knew Israel through the eyes of family and that. Now they were going back to Israel to work and as a, you know, as a as an adult. Um, so it was a chance to give those Israeli Americans a taste of their own home country. So there's a lot of the mothers, uh, teachers who went on the program that you spoke about, and they talked about that it was their first time seeing Israel is from an Israeli perspective that, of course, they know all of Israel. Every Israeli knows every square inch, except for the part they don't know, which is about anywhere from about 10 miles from their home. <laughs> now, the issue is, is that, I, that I'm going to challenge the premise of you're listening to all this. Is Israel the divider? I don't believe so. I believe that Israel is a unifier, more of a unifier today in any time in history. In the 1930s and 40s, we had the Council of American Judaism, anti-Zionist movement that divided this country, not because they were anti-Israel uh, because uh, uh, of a religious reason. They really felt that Israel was going to be the cause of anti-Semitism and the destruction of the American Jewish community. The opposite has happened. The growth of American Jew Jewry is today, they say 7.1, 8.1. You know, in the 19, I, I said this earlier, in the 1960s, Look Magazine wrote an article called The Diminishing Jew. It was going to be, the Jews would be 2.5 million Jews by, by year 2000. And the only thing that has diminished is Look Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is, is that we have to talk about, if we want to engage our young people, about all these great things. We are a great community, getting greater every day, bigger. We are not losing, we're gaining. And if we keep talking about the gains, both in Israel, both here, and our people coming together in a way never seen before, that will propel us to the future. I just want to mention that we'll, we'll take questions at the end, so I see a few hands. If you have questions, please just write them down so you don't forget, and we'll get to you. Um, so thank you, Russell, for adding that you know, level of uh, tension into the discussion. Um, <laughs> It's, it's so important. I heard so much dividing, negative, dividing, negative problems. What Russell is saying is so important. Like people are dealing with the 10% and making it the 90%. We need to deal with the 90%. That is beautiful. And you feel it here, I guess, also. It's, it's nice to feel Israel as a real unifier in this community. Um, so speaking of which, I, I'd like to ask, I'll put it out, a couple people can answer. Um, are there any initiatives that you've identified as cross-cutting or transcending political differences um, in an environment that even if Israel is a unifier and we can all, you know, quabble over that, um, 
it definitely is a can be a point of uh, political contention. So can be. I, I want to take this one. Sure. <laughs> In Israel, I, um, I, I worked as an attorney for four years, and after I realized I didn't do anything wrong to anybody, I <laughs> quit that profession. And then I worked for the Paris Center for Peace, and I worked in the peace industry for seven years. And, um, and, and I'm a secular Israeli from Tel Aviv. Uh, the first time that I visited Israel with a group of 200 women from, I don't know, a few countries, was the first time that I had a meaningful, spiritual um, experience in the Kotel. Now, I've been sworn as a soldier in the Kotel, and it wasn't a meaningful experience for me. So, um, it was almost odd to me, coming from the peace industry, um, that we are bringing women to Israel and we don't deal with politics. As an Israeli, which the only you know, you meet an Israeli, you talk about politics and how much you make. That's our two questions we ask at hello. Um, no politics? What are we going to talk about? Sports? Uh, so, um, on our trips, there's no politics and there is a spiritual connection to the land of Israel. And we don't shy from that. Um, and because this is what connects us. This is what unites us. Now, we're so good, and the media is so good in talking about what divides us, which is politics, and media uses that to sell. But we, the Jewish people, have to focus, like, like Russell said, on what unites us. And the power of 200 or 400 we actually have now, because we have two trips together, women from 15 different countries around the world speaking different languages, but all realize that they have one thing in common, they're Jewish is changing everything and there's no room for politics and no room for any dividedness or nonsense. It seems like I'm always catapulting off Ben. <laughs> um, but I completely agree and we've been doing a lot in the geopolitical area and arena because simply if you ignore politics and it's the elephant in the room, um, people are, if they're coming from communities or if they're coming from campuses, it's something that they're aware of and they're bringing that baggage and that knowledge and perhaps that fear with them on their trip to Israel. And in today's global political climate, Birthright as an organization is apolitical, but we've been doing a lot and the significant changes in this area. We've just uh, finished uh, launching a cadre of 50 experts who have been trained um, on this subject and it's mandatory beginning last summer for all Birthright trips moving forward to have at least two touch points of these experts. One is a, a session with an expert, and the second is a program that ultimately allows participants to meet Jews and non-Jews together and to bring that Arab and Jew environment together and break the concept that when Arab and Jew appear in one sentence or one photo, it's usually about conflict. And either we take participants to Arab communities or vice versa, we're doing lots of work to expose non-political issues in the environment and innovation and we're ultimately acknowledging the reality that the treatment of geopolitical issue has to be forefront, it has to be there, that's why we invested effort and energy and funds to train this, these 50 experts and therefore upgrading the experience on, on each of the trips and not making it the elephant in the room. I just want to add, being a local guy, so I get to take advantage of all of you national and international uh, organizations, I just I agree with everybody saying it, but I think that foundation, you said it really well, Ben, of, focusing on the positivity. I was at a session this morning where they were talking about just the simple images and the joy and the love of Israel rather than what we as Jews and Jewish communities, anti-Semitism, war, terrorism, and that's not really engaging. So we really, we have a group of women going on their, their JWRP mission. Our now gens do a lot of collaborations with JNF Futures. We send birthright buses. I think if we just continue to focus on the core and what can become so easily a love of Israel, then sprinkling in. We just had a great IEC speaker. If you haven't had her come to your community, Lucy Arish, come to come oh, to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Did I pronounce her name wrong? Lucy Arish. Arish, thank you for the right prayer. She is amazing. You can be left, right, center, but she's a proud Israeli, Arab, Muslim, Muslim woman, and she talks about all the conflicts and context. I can tell you I disagreed with half of what she said and I loved everything she said. <laughs> so we've been trying to have opportunities like that 
where we're bringing all the love and the joy and the success, but sprinkling in these things to still let people talk about that elephant in the room, but without trying not to be in a confrontational one, one-sided angle. So I think that, that we as organizations help bring the machitza up that also causes some of the political rift. We were talking about it earlier when I, we took five young Israel rabbis uh, to Israel uh, a couple weeks ago. They had all been there over 50 times collectively. They had lived there. It was their first trip to Israel. That was their words, not mine. We didn't go to Gush Etzion. We didn't go to Ma'ale Adomim, but we took them to the Negev and we took them to the Galil. They met kids from Alexander Musk High School from a public school who came and spent two and a half hours with them. And one of them made the uh, sermon about, I met the other Jewish community and they're as good as us. Now we're putting machitzas up and I think that what you hear Stuart saying is, is that if we gotta put them down, it's the Orthodox and it's the reform and it's the secular and it's the ability to come together for our community and our peace. And yes, there's a political piece that could be the elephant in the table, but we don't even understand the political piece. In the United States, we don't have a parliamentary system. So first we have, we don't know the metric system, much less the parliamentary system, <laughs> okay? So, you know, we're trying to get them to understand this, the system in, in Israel. Who, we don't study it, we don't study the American system. So the elephant in the room is confusing at best and our young people at most do not want to be entertained with that kind of discussion. I, I just want to jump in on a point that's unrelated to why I was invited to be here. Um, but uh, the absolute importance of that experience for Jewish professionals, people working in our organizations. There are so many Jewish professionals who have been to Israel 15 times, but have they been there once when they weren't showing a lay leader where the bathrooms were? We're making sure that you know all the logistics were there. Were they building their own relationship? with Israel that would then come back and transfer to all the work, the work they do back, whether it's at a JCC or human services or whatever. Um, so Let's I think, take a trip. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, we are thinking about a trip for Jewish professionals. So I, was, uh, I was the beneficiary of a program like that and it made a huge difference uh, for me and my colleagues. So Which trip? Something to put out there. Uh, the Rodkin Fellowship through JPRO. JPRO. Do you mind writing your questions down? We're going to get to them at the end. I have some paper. Can you share more about it? It's interesting. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. Um, so speaking of innovative ideas, um, and Russell, I'll start with you. Everyone, I'm sure at least in my parents' generation, uh, remembers the iconic blue box, the JNF Tzedakah box, which really symbolized, you know, for many American Jews, their connection to Israel and um, Australian Jews as well. Israelis Australian as well. Jews as well. Israelis as well. Israelis we have it also. Um, so I'm wondering what you really see as you know the next blue box. What um, can we really hope for to be the next connecting uh, element? Between so I'll give you an example. We took an opportunity that uh, Seth Siegel is here and he wrote a book on water. And we took that opportunity to see if that discussion can have legs beyond uh, ourselves reading about ourselves. And it's, it's a great book and it's called Let There Be Water and if you haven't read it, you should read it. Because it's about not Israel only innovation, but Israel making a difference for itself and making a difference in the world on a very important uh, issue called water. And we took him around the country and had discussions with Jews and non-Jews on college campuses and at uh, events talking about water and its innovation. Now it could be somewhat, you know, uh, boring if you think about it. I mean, is this a technology conversation? But it wasn't. It was a human conversation about Israel, innovation, making it and making it happen. And across the country, by the way, every college campus that he went to, there was never a protest. And it was all Israel oriented. We had people who came there to protest. Within about five minutes of the discussion, it's very hard when you're talking about a subject that's about changing the world. And so those kind of innovations are, are well, the discussions are the innovations. Uh, Blue Box was an, ex was an example to, to unify the Jewish community spread throughout the world. It was a methodology of fundraising that became an ideology. And the discussion that we have to have is that conversation about who we are and what we're doing. 
Anyone else? Anyone else? Any idea? And we're waiting for your blue box. Yeah, who else has a blue and box? And with interest, it's about a million and a half dollars. I guess, uh, you know, federations, you can say, have had their own blue box. Very traditional, I'll say somewhat uh, siloed, hierarchical approach to life. I'm somewhat of a newbie to federation, so I guess I can say those things. Uh, my first job in a federation was running one. Um, and what we're really trying to do, and it correlates to a lot of what we're talking about of putting the mechitzas away, of not talking about campaign. When we're engaged in the Israeli community, American community, when we're engaged in the now gen, we have no campaign strategy, zero. We don't measure the success by a metric of donors and dollars. Don't get me wrong, we recognize that when they get more engaged in Jewish life, they'll give to the Federation, they'll give the JNF, they'll give to their synagogue, they'll give to oh, whoever, but we're really trying to get rid of that Federation blue box mentality and really look to be in the relationship business instead of the transactional business. That's how we approached our engagement of the Israeli American community. We're having, wild, well, for our, our metrics, wild success uh, in engaging the now gen and really just trying to, I think it somewhat corresponds to what Russell is saying, take a very different non-traditional approach to Jewish life. Something actually that um, we've been noticing is um, the opportunity in Israel for a new trend of giving impact investing, um, which is very trendy and popular among you know a lot of uh, young Jews and young givers. Um, Israel has so much innovation going on in, in fields of global importance and social good and the ability also to uh, get that message across to people who want to be investing but with the double bottom line and you know, do good um, with their giving. I think that's also um, something interesting now that we're seeing emerge potentials for Israel. Anything else here? Just on the innovation front, uh, we believe and we'd like to think that birthright experience is gonna become and continue to be a rite of passage for all individuals 18 to 26 around the world. No other modality has a better track record um, than birthright. I would like to continue that as an innovation. Innovation can have two different definitions. Great, well thank you everyone. Um, I just wanna go back actually to what Shoam um, Nicolette, the CEO said in his opening remarks yesterday, which I thought um, were very insightful. He said that it's not about really building bridges, but it's about integration. Um, and I think that what you are all doing um, is really doing that not just building a bridge, but really seeing each other, like you were saying, as, as one, um, finding what's in common, um, strengthening those opportunities in our communities. So thank you all. Um, and now we have some time for questions, so please stand up and uh, start with you. And please also, if you could frame your question with the how, when, what, that would be great. Okay, I, I just in terms of perspective for a minute, because we're talking about this elephant in It's more fun with the blue box. The blue box. <laughs> like, I want to hug that That's thing. What is this? That's our newest innovation that came up with. That's the new blue box. Yes. Go for it. With I'll, a, uh, I'll treat that as a question and respond. Okay. <laughs> uh, in, in a word, yes. Um, yeah, uh, you know, the D 
DNA of Onward Israel. We are not an Israel travel program. We don't think of ourselves as an Israel tra travel program. We are an internship program. <laughs> Thank you. And the logo is fantastic. Um, uh, Onward Israel continues to this day to be run as an internship program. And our competition are other internship career building opportunities. Um, that's how our customer thinks, and that's how we have to think. And yes, uh, there's a secondary for the participant. Um, there's often an element of Jew being Jewishly seeking and Israel uh, interested in, in growth around Israel. And yes, for the employer, uh, Zionism is a piece of why they participate. But the internship always comes first. And that's how we're able to get uh, well over 1,000 participants. Um, and that's how ultimately we're able to have that experience where they can then uh, talk about the elephant because it wasn't what brought them there in the first place. Hi, my name is Jill Mossman. I'm a Jewish colleague who still works at the Jewish Institute of Israel. We've emailed before, I think. <laughs> So is that defining the population specifically for the children of Israeli Americans or American Israelis, however they define themselves? So mixed marriages, if you will, <laughs> mixed families. <laughs> or, or together. Yeah, together. Um, I mean, one thing that we've done in our community um, is, I think it just goes back to the programming, trying to be together. When we launched the Scouts program, um, just started, so we don't have that many, but we intentionally from the very get-go, started marketing not just to our Israeli-American families, but also to, also to American Jewish families. I always get confused what to call who, because I look at everybody the same, of trying to do that. I mean, Shahar, I want to keep giving him compliments, said to me when we were doing some thinking and strategy, even a lot of the kids of the Israeli-Americans, they're growing up American. So even they're very different than their parents. So we're trying to create programming that can be for all, because I don't think you can do individual programming or you're gonna continue along that lens. So we just try to do it by trying to integrate almost everything we do out of those introductory programs to pull them together. I don't know if that addresses that or not. So Jill, I think that the conference and the IAC in itself has broken the glass ceiling. First, that you can even have the conversation, because we did it. It was like the whispering, you know, cancer. We, you know, we didn't, we didn't talk about it. So the talking about it and the IEC has allowed it to be a conversation and a legal conversation and an honest conversation. I think that what you're hearing with Stuart too is that there's going to be an integration. It's an immigrant society. And there's going to be, in any immigrant society, a time in which they're going to come together with the society in which they have come to live. And there is a, you, you're trying to constantly work, but the Israel Scouts is the perfect program, not only in Phoenix, but around the country, where now non-Israeli Americans are joining the Israel Scouts. And Aliyah, the largest Aliyah to Israel, comes from North America, 50,000 people in 10 years through Nefesh Benefesh. Now, we didn't talk about Aliyah. Aliyah was not a subject that we would even rave about. It was, God forbid, at Alexander Musk High School, they would worry about ever talking about anybody who made Aliyah because then you would take your kids there and for sure they would leave. Today, it's a conversation, so it's both ways. And I think that that is where we're going. And, and that's the beautiful thing of an IEC, and that's the beautiful thing of a Nefesh Benefesh, 
is that it's not Aliyah from the lands of distress, it's Aliyah from the lands of opportunity. And you can have that dual allegiance and dual love. Next question. Just to oh, answer your question, sorry, Chaya. Uh, that we specifically re receive funding for children of Israeli Americans to go on birthright and to have that experience. And the local federation right here in Washington has a reverse mifkash to bring them back as well. So you're welcome to send us more of your children. <laughs> um, if, if I can add, because I think I have another hat of the IAC as well here, um, and I don't want to ruin the party, but we're not the same. We're not the same. We are, we are actually quite different. The Israelis and the American Jews are quite different in many levels. Um, I do agree that in the end, this is an immigrant community that will be dissolved in some way into the, hopefully, into the Jewish community, or they won't, by the way. Uh, the Pew Report shows that 80% um, of the Israeli immigrants um, um, in the United States um, interfaith marry and actually um, are out of the Jewish uh, family after a generation. So maybe they won't. Um, the movement is going to be just more because the world is getting smaller and people travel more and travel is easier. And the, the migration question just becomes an obvious thing. Um, in the same way that 20 years ago, people moved in the States from one city to another for a job, now it's becoming a country. And my friends, researchers here in the NIH move from Israel not because they don't want to be in Israel, because the research institutes in the States are the ones that their profession is leading them towards. And most of them are not aware about what it even means to live in a diaspora and what you need to do actively to, be, to remain Jewish, which the American Jews and my colleagues from the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs know this. They found our program. And they say that the Israelis don't have the diaspora defense mechanism. We don't. I never went to shul in my, in my life in, in, in Israel. And if I did for Yom Kippur, I would stay outside. I would never go in. And here I need to make uh, an effort to change that because this is not the same reality I used to live in. And this is not obvious. And this is an awareness question. To answer your question, so first of all, we need awareness. We're not the same. And the IAC is trying to help with that. Um, like Russell said, just start the conversation. We have amazing minds, and, and I don't know how many years of experience we can deal with it. And by the way, it's not the first time this is happening. This has happened before in history for other peoples and for our people as well. Um, to answer for JWRP, we are bringing uh, in December the first group of IAC Israeli American mothers to come on our trip. And we want to learn from this and see what they bring to the picture. And we want to continue that conversation with them. But if I may, that reality, I just want to add to that, that's synagogue fundraising. The community system is broken the way that we had it 10 and 20 and 25 years. Not bad, it's the reality of it. You raise money in a synagogue. When they raised money for my grandfather, it was telling my grandfather, you had to put your name at the synagogue so your grandchildren would see your name. I give to my synagogue knowing that my children will never be in that synagogue. They'll be somewhere else. But that is the reality of our community, of kids living everywhere and people moving. The nuclear family is not with the Jewish community because of intelligence because of uh, education, because of economics, and we're gonna move around. So we, as are dealing with it on all levels, it's the Israeli-American, but it's the American Jewish community as well. And that whole community fabric, you know, the reason you gave to Jewish families or to a home for the elderly in your own local community was that's where your parents would go. Today, you're living in a community that your parents don't live in. They go to Florida. That's why you give to Florida. <laughs>
Sorry, do you have a question addressed to a single panelist? Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you addressing a question to a single panelist? No. no? Okay. The, qu the question, though. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Russell. Russell, he has well, a little box. Nice to look at me. <laughs> I think that it's an issue that you should bring. I think that the IEC conference is maybe not the, the, the conversation, uh, but there are many programs. There's a birthright programs, and if there's connection to Judaism, if there's uh, Jewish women, uh, uh, that I think is one of those great innovations. How long has it been? How long has your program been? Since 2009. So 2009, uh, you have those, those entrepreneurial kind of systems. And so I think that there's infrastructure there and a conversation that we can have. Thank you. An any last question? No? OK, well, thank you all. Thank you to our panelists for an exciting discussion. Thank you. And hope to continue it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.